I'm a GI medical oncologist at Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I am a member, a proud member, of OncoAlert. Our fearless leader, Gil Morgan, asked me to record some of my thoughts about abstracts I'm excited about in advance of the 2020 ASCO meeting. And as we all know, this is something of an unprecedented conference. I have to say, I look forward to ASCO every year. It's such a wonderful opportunity to see colleagues from around the globe congregate in one place. This year, it will be virtual. Uh, it'll be different. It might set a precedent for future meetings, uh, but I do hope that we never entirely lose uh, sort of the in-person contact uh, with friends and colleagues from around the world. I think there's both tangible and intangible benefits to that, but for the time being, I think we should acknowledge the public health risk of traveling and gathering during the pandemic and respect ASCO's decision. So every year when the abstracts drop, I sort of pour myself a cup of strong coffee and get ready to review them. Uh, as a GI oncologist, I do have an understandable bent in my practice uh, towards uh, GI malignancies. And so what I'll refer to here is largely uh, concerning colorectal cancer uh, and pancreatic cancer. So I'll start um, actually not even with an abstract, but with a paper that frankly, I don't think got quite enough attention when it came out in uh, GMA oncology around this time last year by Reinert et al regarding um, analysis of plasma cell-free DNA um, in stage one uh, through three colorectal cancer. And there were some very interesting uh, takeaways here to my mind, if you don't mind, I'll just read so I don't misquote anything. So they had 130 patients between stage one and three. Uh, and at post-operative day 30, uh, patients who were CT DNA positive were seven times more likely to relapse uh, than those who were negative. Uh, and shortly after completion of adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, uh, CCDNA positive patients were 17 times more likely to relapse. And I think there's some biological plausibility there that if you still have a positive uh, tumor DNA signal after the completion of your adjuvant therapy, um, you're almost certainly dealing with a persistent or resistant uh, subclone uh, that is going to then rear its ugly head. And indeed, in the study, out of 130, there were seven patients who were CCDNA positive after adjuvant chemotherapy and they all um, experienced relapse. So with that said, I'd like to pivot a little bit uh, to an abstract from this meeting. Uh, Dr. Kazi um, from the University of Iowa uh, and a luminary in GI oncology and on medical Twitter is the lead author. It's entitled Tumor Informed Assessment of Molecular Residual Disease and its Incorporation into Practice for Patients with Early and Advanced Stage Colorectal Cancer, the CRC-MRD Consortium. And I should note that along with uh, Pashtun, there's other uh, stars from the world of GI Onc, like Van Morris and Scott Kopetz from MD Anderson, um, Jason Starr from uh, Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, Axel Grothy, uh, who was one of my mentors, and, and many others. And then it is important to note, I think, that this is specifically testing um, a Signatera assay, and they call it, I like this phrase, a bespoke assay. So as I understand it, um, it actually looks at um, 16 different signatures that are actually derived from the patient's um, tumor specimen itself, and then sort of they look for um, congruent signals in the blood. I may be slightly misstating that, but I think that's where the bespoke part comes in. So here they discuss, um, I think probably the largest real world experience to date, um, using um, this proprietary CTDNA test uh, to follow patients across really the spectrum of colorectal cancer, uh, and with some other GI malignancies as well. So the, the total N is 250. There were 200 colon patients, 40 rectal patients, and then the remaining 10 were basically miscellany between anal cancer, appendiceal cancer, and small bowel cancer. And they're really looking at the CTDNA, um, both its um, quantitative level in terms of uh, mean tumor uh, molecules per milliliter of um, plasma, uh, but also um, MRD positivity rates. Um, what they found was a significant association between CTDNA levels and stage. Uh, in my back of the envelope math, I think there's at least a 40-fold difference uh, between the quantity of CT CTDNA they could find in uh, stage one versus uh, stage four. Um, so again, that's showing you sort of a, a, a huge leap um, in the volume of the circulating tumor DNA as sort of the stages progress. They don't show you stepwise st stages two and three, um, but um, I'd be curious to see if it's linear or if it's exponential. Uh, and then they found that uh, in patients who had radiographically measurable active metastatic disease, uh, and the N there was 
was, I believe, 49, um, that 100% of those had um, detectable uh, ctDNA. Uh, on the contrary, and this is interesting, um, patients um, with uh, metastatic disease or advanced disease who were thought to be rendered NED, and this is kind of troubling, um, I believe still had just under a 20% rate of ctDNA positivity. I tell my patients all the time, particularly when we're talking about adjuvant chemo, which is sort of the hardest cell in oncology and it should be, that really what we're doing is we're, we're chasing ghosts. We're eliminating uh, a microscopic threat that, at least until now, we couldn't see. And I, I think that, um, I may be over-optimistic, but I'm hoping that ctDNA sort of becomes part of our uh, risk assessment and that we can deliver adjuvant therapy more intelligently. I will say there are some signals here that validate um, our traditional risk stratification based on, say, you know, TNM and AGCC staging. Um, but there's also some signals that that um, methodology is not perfect. And I've actually described adjuvant chemo in my patients and maybe even conceptualized it myself as the trolley problem in ethics, where if you don't do something, you know that substantial harm is going to occur. People are going to recur. But if you do something, you also know that you're going to harm uh, at least a smaller a segment of the population. And we know that chemo, adjuvant chemotherapy for colon cancer, for instance, is not without its risks. I think the IDEA trial, which we'll get to in a second, the update on that, uh, was a huge leap forward in showing us that there is a subset, um, particularly the T3N1 risk stratum, uh, where you can probably, quote, get away uh, with less chemo, meaning that um, three months of um, KPOX uh, appeared uh, non-inferior to six months of KPOX in that particular uh, risk level. Um, and, and to me, that was, a, that was a huge leap forward um, in the field. I vividly remember when it was presented at Plenary a few years back. And it's kind of the perfect counter argument to, you know, our critics and conspiracy theorists who would say, oh, we're just in it for the money. Oncologists just love giving chemo because, you know, we're making so much money off of it. You know, I think that um, Plenary, uh, I think Taylor X, uh, where we found out there was a segment of women with breast cancer whom we could spare from adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Um, you know, these are all signs that we want to be doing less. We want to be doing less damage while maintaining or increasing benefit to our patients. And it's funny, uh, the ASCO plenary, you know, happened with IDEA and then my cab driver uh, to the airport um, from McCormick to O'Hare, uh, he was one of the conspiracy theorists who said that all oncologists are, you know, we're, we're paid off by pharma and we essentially are, um, remunerated uh, by units of chemo given. So that was a nice uh, counter argument uh, to be able to give him at that time. Um, regardless, let me get back to this particular abstract. So it's interesting, kind of small numbers here in terms of um, how the uh, earlier stages were represented, and that's no surprise. But you know, of the six stage one patients, none of them had any uh, MRD. Um, and here's where I really find interesting. Stage two, I think for a long time, has been a really um, troublesome um, stage two um, to separate. Um, you know, we know there's high risk stage two based largely on um, histopathologic and clinical features. And, and here what I found fascinating is that about 7% of the uh, stage twos that we would traditionally consider low risk uh, had MRD um, versus a third of the higher risk stage twos had MRD. And that was actually comparable, at least in this cohort, um, to the high risk stage threes, the T4s and twos. So um, I've often conceptualized that high risk stage two, especially with a, a T4 signal, might be just as um, sort of worse off prognostically um, as sort of the higher level stage threes. And I know this is not really powered to show that, but again, I thought it was very interesting. And then finally, uh, in the stage four oligometastatic setting where they thought they'd rendered patients NED after either resection or ablation, 45% of those patients still had positive ctDNA. So I think we have to be very careful um, sometimes about what we tell patients after these um, interventions. I think um, oligometastatectomy in colorectal cancer over the last 15 years, say, has been a huge leap forward uh, in um, potentially curing uh, some of our stage four patients. Uh, as one of my faculty taught me at Mayo, he said, um, you know, we used to think uh, even a single weed was too many weeds in the garden concerning liver function. Um, and I don't think that's true anymore. So back to what I was saying, you know, I think that um, there is certainly a stage four uh, population who, who can be um, cured, you know, durably in remission 
uh, for as long as we surveil them, post-resection, ablation, or some combination thereof. But I also think we need to be very hesitant to you know, be coming out of those procedures and saying, quote, we got it all, uh, which I think all medical oncologists, it's a phrase that um, gives us pause because we don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. So with that, I'll pivot to the um, update from IDEA. Um, and again, this was, and I know the phrase is overused, but I think it was a game changer. Apologies to Vinay Prasad if he's watching this. I know he hates that phrase. Um, when this um, was presented at ASCO Plenary, I think it, it absolutely deserved that stage. You know, when I left that plenary, I knew that my practice would immediately uh, change. And in fact, it did. And I really feel like what it's been able to do for me in the interim is spare, hopefully a significant amount of my patients from permanent neuropathy from oxaliplatin that they otherwise would not have needed. Um, you know, when we saw the rates of you know, grade three uh, chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy basically dropped from, I think, 45% to 15% uh, with no appreciable loss in um, survival, three-year, at the time, three-year disease-free survival, um, with, I think, more judicious use of uh, oxaliplatin-containing regimens, and again, largely KFOX. Uh, that was just a huge uh, moment for me because it, it showed me I could sort of get away with less. I could administer less chemo, inflict less iatrogenic harm, and hopefully have um, roughly comparable oncologic outcomes. So as many of us will remember, uh, the IDEA trial technically did not um, demonstrate uh, non-inferiority um, in terms of three-year disease-free survival for all stage three patients receiving three months versus six months of full FOX or KFOX. Um, however, uh, there was a signal there that I think is important to this day, which is that um, KPOX and FOLFOX, I do not think should be considered interchangeable. Um, I think KPOX may, and this is just my conjecture, although I've heard others say it too, may come out ahead in the three-month group because of greater um, early dose intensity of both the fluoroprimidine uh, and the oxide platin. Uh, but again, that's just a theory. So here, they're presenting us with um, updates uh, from IDEA, uh, which now include the five-year overall survival. So then we were uh, looking at three-year disease-free survival, now we have the five-year OS. So across six studies, the authors note, and here um, the lead author is Dr. Sobrero, uh, but Dr. Andre Meyerhart Grothy uh, are, of course, on the uh, abstract. Uh, and then I should note, uh, appropriately, the last author is uh, Quian Shi, um, who is the statistician uh, at uh, Mayo Clinic. And uh, she, of course, is carrying the torch for uh, Dan Sargent, who was the initial sort of statistical mastermind here and unfortunately passed away. So um, as a Mayo alum myself, uh, he was a absolute giant in the field and incredibly prolific and smart. And so we should remember Dan, uh, Dr. Sargent, uh, when we're looking at IDEA. Regardless, back to the numbers. So across six studies, just under 40% of patients, and remember this is a multinational uh, study, so it's also going to encompass some practice variations from nation to nation. Uh, so almost 40% received KPOX. And then um, overall, um, the five-year um, survival rate was 82.4% um, for three months and 82.8% uh, for six months. Um, and as you might imagine, um, the uh, hazard ratio is 1.02 and the confidence interval, of course, crosses one. Um, there doesn't appear to be any meaningful uh, difference there in uh, five-year um, overall survival. Uh, nor um, disease-free survival. And so they conclude, and I, I agree with this, uh, overall survival and five-year disease-free survival results continue to support the use of three months of adjuvant KPOX for the vast majority of stage three colon cancer patients. The conclusion is strengthened by the substantial reduction in toxicities, inconveniences, and costs associated with short treatment duration. Um, and again, um, there's a nice table in this abstract that I encourage people to look at. Again, I think it validates that there really is a difference between KPOX and FOLFOX. I think it also validates the risk stratification of um, T3N1 versus T4 and or N2. Um, so the IDEA trial, I think, uh, in its uh, ongoing five-year maturation now, uh, is convincing in terms of um, no obvious uh, survival decrement uh, with deintensification de or truncation uh, to three months versus six months of KPOX. So I feel uh, fairly convinced there, and that's how I will plan the practice. Okay, moving to... Uh, pancreatic, and then ending on some speculation. Um, so in pancreatic, um, again, I'm showing my bias, but I thought, uh, I think it's two years ago now, 
Um, you know, Prio Pink One was great, but Prodigy uh, Twenty Four was um, again, I think, a paradigm shift, uh, showing us the longest ever survivals we'd seen uh, with a delivery of adjuvant uh, fulfirinox to select patients uh, with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And you know, one of the things I really admired about the largely French investigators of that study is that you know they started at uh, one dose level. Uh, and then quickly realized that um, you know to to maximize tolerance while also keeping an eye on efficacy, you know some dose modifications needed to be made. So um, again, in my practice, I've I've followed the uh, latter uh, part of the protocol with omission of the 5 fu bolus and upfront dropping the arenatecan from 180 to 150 milligrams per square meter. I think that makes a big difference. Um, what's interesting though is I increasingly think of um, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma is a systemic disease, uh, with the very possible exception of stage 1a. Um, I sort of think that everybody merits um, systemic therapy, and even some of those. And I also think that um, total neoadjuvant therapy is finding its way in um, uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So I've been through a Whipple myself. It wasn't for a PDAC, it was for a PNET. Um, but the reason I'm telling you that is I know uh, from my own post-op course, which was no picnic, I had uh, five weeks of delayed gastric emptying, and I was um, requiring NG decompression for almost that entire period, and I was on TPN. Um, I don't think I would have withstood um, adjuvant chemo at the two-month mark, and maybe not even by the three-month mark, and I certainly couldn't have handled a triplet uh, if it had been recommended to me. Um, so I think for multiple reasons, including better patient selection, and there was a hint of this from Priopank 1, I think it makes sense to think increasingly about um, new adjuvant treatment, possibly even total new adjuvant treatment. So um, what I wanted to talk about now was the um, abstract concerning SWOG 1505, um, which is results of uh, perioperative chemotherapy with modified fulfirinox versus gemcitabine and braxine for resectable uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So this was a randomized phase two trial um, of uh, periop chemotherapy, so 12 weeks before, 12 weeks after, with either modified fulfirinox or, or gem abraxine. And what they're presenting here are the uh, final efficacy and toxicity results for eligible patients. So over the course of the trial, they um, had just over 100 eligible patients, so 55 in ARM1 and 47 in ARM2. And there's a lot of interesting things to take away here, uh, one of which is I think the... Um, there's sort of been this notion that, you know, um, from, you know, Animal Farm, you know, uh, two legs good, four legs better. Or maybe it was the other way around. Sorry if I'm misquoting Orwell. But regardless, the notion that, um, uh, that more drugs is, is uh, going to increase outcome or improve outcome. Um, and I think what this is actually showing, and again, I know this is, needs to be validated, um, is that um, gemabraxine may actually uh, not be may not be uh, inferior uh, to uh, modified fulfirinox in this perioperative approach, uh, and in fact may have some um, advantages even. So um, the two-year overall survival was um, uh, 40, just under 42% for the fulfirinox arm and 49% uh, for the gemabraxian arm. Uh, the median overall survival respectfully was 22.4 months and 23.6 months, neither of which was um, showing a statistical significance based on their a priori threshold. Um, the median disease-free survival after section was 10.9 months in the fulfirinex arm and 14.2 months in the gemabraxian arm. Um, so the authors reached some interesting conclusions. Um, they said they found adequate um, safety and high resectability rates with perioperative chemo. And it should be said that uh, almost 70% in uh, patients in both arms uh, were resected. And this is what I find interesting, and I, I don't see um, p-values here unless I'm, I'm missing them, but um, the rate of complete or major pathologic response was actually higher on the gemabraxian side at 42% versus 25% in the fulfirinox arm. Also, in terms of who completed all treatment, it was actually skewed towards the uh, fulfirinox arm by about 10%, um, and 60% in both cohorts actually started their post-op chemotherapy. And again, that's slightly counterintuitive to me in the sense that you know, you would think a triplet would be harder, uh, harder to complete. And interestingly, the rates of neutropenia are actually higher in the gemabraxine arm. And again, I don't have p-values for these, so I don't know the significance. The numbers are not massive. 
Um, but the author's final statement, I think, is really quite telling. It says there's little evidence that either regimen improves overall survival compared with the historical uh, standard. So that's sobering. And then lastly, and it's a plenary session, which is really exciting, but it also means I don't have the abstract to discuss. I think Keynote 177 is something we've been waiting for. Um, so this is going to be the trial looking at uh, pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy for uh, MSI high or mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer. Um, we've certainly seen um, sort of crescendoing to this at ASCO GI now for several years. Uh, I think it's going to be fascinating uh, to see if you know IO actually sort of overtakes uh, chemo in uh, upfront management of these uh, particularly um, immunosensitive or presumptively immunosensitive tumors. And so that's the one I'm really waiting for uh, at Plenary. Um, and all in all, again, I'm really excited about ASCO 2020. I think it's going to be different. Uh, but again, perhaps there are things that we should take away from this meeting, and this remains to be seen how it will all play out. Uh, to my Uncle Art, uh, Uncle Alert colleagues, uh, I miss you greatly. And so I'd like to end um, with a little toast. So Gil and I share a taste. Excuse me. This is not beer. This is a wonderful mineral water comes from Monterey, Mexico, called Topo Chico. When I drink it in the conference calls, I realize people do think I am um, imbibing alcohol work, and I assure you I'm not doing that. Uh, but I will raise a glass to everyone, a bottle to everyone, and say uh, to your health, salud, uh, sante, slanch, is what we would say uh, in my um, country of origin. And I wish you all the best. Here's to your great aspect.